scripture from Micah 6 this morning. Micah 6. Micah 6. Starting at that first verse this morning as we continue our sermon series on resistance preaching this morning. You know, the buzzword is resistance. Everybody wants to resist now. Some folk already say they all resisted out. Notice there ain't a whole lot of black folks saying that. Black folk been resisting. <laughs> From the book of Micah, Micah 6, 1 through 8. But first, as usual, let us recite our mission statement found printed on the backs of our bulletins so we can remind ourselves why we exist as a congregation. Let us recite that together. To establish a Christ in the church. For the care of the people of the world in a way that provides a people-inclusive environment conducive to praise, worship, and spiritual growth. This church will promote the uncompromised Word of God and the feeding of the hungry, healing and deliverance of the sick and oppressed, clothing the naked, visiting the stranger, visiting the prison bound, educating the unlearned, and loving the unloved. We will also support other ministries and organizations sharing our mission so that the communities of believers are formed and transformed by the renewing of hearts and minds to the good and acceptable will of God. Amen. Hallelujah. From the book of Micah this morning, Micah 6, verses 1 through 8. Hear now the word of the Lord from the New Revised Standard Version of God's holy and precious word. Hear what the Lord says. Rise, plead your case before the mountains. Let the hills hear your voice. Hear, you mountains, the controversy of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a controversy with his people, and he will continue with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? In what way have I wearied you? Answer me. For well, I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery, and I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what King Balak of Moab devised. What Balaam, son of Beor, answered him, and what happened from Shittim to Gilead, that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with the thousands of rams, the ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. He has told you, O oh Lord, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Praise God. O oh Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable only in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and redeemer the people of God said, Amen. Amen. If you don't mind, remain standing for the singing of the Black National Anthem. We will only sing the first stanza today.
Amen. This morning from the book of Micah, Micah 6, 1 through 8, I want to talk about, if I can, uh, to continue this resistance preaching sermon series, I want to talk about the hood prophet. Brooke Wayne like that one. I like to talk about the hood prophet. In our text this morning, Israel had gotten off the road of righteousness and began to walk down the road of unrighteousness and rebellion. They pretty much became apostate in their beliefs and in their worship. The times were good for some, however. There was peace and prosperity in the land. The government was growing in power and might. The powers that be centralized all government affairs in Jerusalem. But in their prosperity and in their accumulation of wealth, somebody had to pay off with all of this. Those somebodies were poor peasants trying hard to earn a living. In other words, while the political leaders were busy running amok financing their military programs, right. while the political leaders were busy forming unholy alliances with other nations, <laughs> while the political leaders were busy counting the people and making sure everybody was in her or his place, while the political leaders were busy making sure that the wealth stayed in the hands of the very few, the peasant poor people were back home suffering and starving. I'm so glad I was talking about things that happened back then instead of things that happened to I'm glad that none of this is familiar. But, it is. but then to make matters worse, the religious leaders were co-opted into this. In other words, this type of leadership became advantageous to the religious leaders of the day, so they too started to bless whatever political leaders wanted to do. They started shaping theology around culture instead of the culture being shaped by the theology. But the worst thing that they did was to pretty much ignore what was happening to the poor. They didn't say anything about what was happening, didn't care about what was happening. Poor people showing up into their worship centers and churches and places of worship and nothing was said about the poor and the suffering. And I'm so glad I'm talking about things that happened yesteryear instead of today. But then the Lord got time. God loves God's people very much. But every now and then, God gets tired of our foolishness. So the Lord raised up a prophet to go and speak to the powers that be. But God didn't raise him up from the ecclesiastical academy. God did not raise him up from the political leadership of the day. God didn't raise him up from the rabbinical schools of the day. No, God rose up this prophet from the ranks of the poor and the marginalized. God raised them up from the backwater towns and the forgotten places. God raised them up from places where good folk just don't want to go or don't want to be around at night. God raised them up from a place where all the tax cuts and tax burdens were affecting the people to live life and that more abundantly. God raised up Micah. Yeah, I say, God raised them up from the hood. Yeah. All right. All right. Micah comes from a place called Morrisville which is in the southern part of Judah. In other words, Micah comes from the margins of society. Micah comes from a place where he has seen poverty and death. Yes. He comes from a place where he has seen how these governmental programs are disenfranchising the poor. He comes from the place where some folk voted to install certain leaders that's going to do harm to them. I'm so glad that it doesn't happen anymore. Comes from a place where he can see dejection and depression as military, political, and religious leaders form a unholy trinity held bent on power, prestige, and honor. Yeah. Yeah. Comes from a place where suffering is commonplace yeah. because of the inequities of the day. So Micah goes up north to the power brokers. Feel with the Spirit of the Lord to proclaim what thus says the Lord. 
But unlike his prophetic contemporaries, Micah doesn't kowtow to the status quo. All right. Micah doesn't say what they wanted to hear. Micah doesn't placate the leadership by tingling their ears and giving them nice and pleasant sayings. Micah doesn't vacillate or weave back and forth from opinion to opinion. Micah gives them to gives it to them straight up with no chaser. All right. All right. In other words, can I just be plain with it? Can I bring it down to, to a G-Life interpretation? If Michael was invited to the White House, he wouldn't just stand for four walks and grin for the cameras. Michael Jeff would not have been happy just to meet the president without a plan or an agenda. Michael would not allow himself to be bought for pennies and trinkets of power. Michael would not sell out the folks who make them possible for him to be invited to the White House in the first place. If invited to the White House, Trump Plaza, Marco, or any other place, Marco would have stood up and spoken up. Do I know this? Well, rally it in the text. Micah does just that. I hear Micah saying this morning to the military leaders. Woe to those who plan iniquity. Yeah. Those who plot evil on their beds. Yeah. At morning light, they carry it out because it's in their power to do it. They cut the fields and seize them and the houses and take them. I hear Michael saying to the political leaders this morning, listen, you leaders of Jacob, you rulers of Israel, you should, should you know, should you not know justice? You who hate good and love evil, who tear the skin from my people and the flesh from their bones. I hear Michael saying to the religious leaders this morning, as for the prophets who lead God's people astray, if one feeds them, they proclaim peace. If not, prepare to wage war against them. Therefore, night will come over you and without visions and darkness, without divination. The sun was set for the prophets and the day would go dark for them. Micah continues to talk about how leadership despised justice and distorted all what is right. Micah goes on and talks about how leadership often took pride and how the priest taught whatever that was going on at the time. If it was good for the leadership, it was good for the church. Michael goes on and talks about how prophets prophesied only for money and how what they did was wrapped up and couched steeped in a theology of prosperity. Yeah. Mm. He even had the nerve to believe that they were doing right in the eyesight of God. Mm -hmm. They believed that no disaster would come upon them. Michael had to go and tell folk that you just can't break the law because you are in power to do so. And I'm so glad again that I'm talking about like a day. Back then and not now. Then Michael saw something different. Michael saw a corrupt system that was tearing the leadership away from God, but also in the process was tearing up poor and marginalized people in the villages. And if I told you one thing, G Life, I told you God just don't like when you mess with God's people, especially if they are poor and on the margins of society. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just saw the devastation that the plan, the privilege had on the poor. I just saw how they were losing their land and being kicked out of their homes. Michael saw how ruthless the leadership could be when they had no idea what was going on back in the hood. Michael would say to somebody today, why are you signing executive orders you have no reason or no business signing or you have not even read for yourself? Yes, yes, yes. Johnson, Johnson. Maybe that's what we need. Maybe we need some more prophets from the hood. Yeah. Voices that cry out in the wilderness. Maybe we need more prophets from the hood. Voices that speak truth to power. Maybe we need more prophets from the hood. People in relationships and friendships with the poor and marginalized who can speak up on their behalf. Maybe we need more prophets from the hood. Voices that will let the powers be that we know that a rising tide don't lift all boats. 
Because if you're in a yacht and if I'm in a canoe, a rising tide could drown me. Maybe we need more prophets from the who? Voices that can declare that many of our laws are inherently unfair. Maybe we need more prophets from the who? Voices that lift concerns of the voices we fail to hear. A lot of times and many times, it's not that the people on the margins are not talking. Right, right. We just not listening. Right, right. Maybe we need more prophets from the hood. Voices that stand with the outcast to put down the demoralized citizens of the day. Maybe more prophets from the hood. Yeah. Voices that can articulate a larger vision, yeah. a better way for man, yeah. for yeah. humankind, and for women and men to stand up and be what God has called them to be. Yeah. Maybe we need more prophets from the good church. All right. That know what it means to be let down, stepped on, pushed over, not heard, abused, bruised, oppressed, depressed, repressed, and even, yeah, possessed. <laughs> Maybe we need more prophets from the hood that won't have to wait for an election not to go the way that you wanted it to go okay. before you get out in the streets and resist All and right. protest and act. And put on hats and march and talk about why everybody else ain't doing like we doing. Right. Where were you? Yeah. Yes, yes. When? But the good news this morning is that we supposed to have that type of prophet. Mm -hmm. And it should be the people of God. Yeah, <laughs> Listen, in our text this morning, Israel is on trial. The Lord thought my, the, uh, uh, the Lord rather through Micah goes first. The Lord rhetorically asks, my people, what have I done to you? Have I burdened you? I brought you out of Egypt. Right. Redeemed you from the land of slaves. I sent Moses to lead you with Arian and Miriam. Don't forget Miriam was there. Remember your journey so that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. In other words, remember how I cared for you. Remember how I delivered you. Remember what was done for you in your behalf. Remember that I love you because when you do, you will begin to know the righteous acts of the Lord. But not only Israel that should remember, we need to remember as well. We need to remember that the Lord has been good to us. We need to remember that the Lord has brought us a mighty long way. We need to remember that the Lord has made a way somehow. God has made a way out of no way many times for many of us. We need to remember that the Lord has brought us here to this place for a reason and in a season. We need to remember that the Lord hasn't done anything wrong to us. We need to remember that the Lord hasn't broken any of God's promises. We need to remember the Lord is still providing for us. We need to remember that the Lord is still working it out, even through ups and downs, even what life throws our way. We need to remember that if it had not been for the Lord on our side, where would we be? It's when we remember all of this, we can start to appreciate the righteous acts of the Lord. After the Lord spoke, the people start begin to remember. I like that when the people, oh, I got you, Lord. They begin to remember. They start to think about what they had done. So they came up with a solution. They asked, with what shall I come before the Lord with? They heard the prophet's declaration. They heard the words of the prophet. So those so, so, so people wanted to know, how, how can we show the Lord that we saw? How can we make this thing up to God? How can I show my, my sorrowfulness? How can I show that I get it, Lord? How can I show? Should I come to God with burnt offerings? With calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with a thousands of rain, with thousands of rain, ten thousand rivers of oil? Should I offer my firstborn of my transgression, fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? What shall I bring to the Lord? What is it that the Lord wants? And I'm not even knocking that. Because after you have been convicted, after you've heard from the prophet and after you have heard internally from the Lord, you should ask, Lord, what is it? Should I, what should I do? Yeah. But, you see, part of the problem was what they offered. Mm -hmm. 
Israel was used to buying whatever Israel wanted. <coughs> they used to cutting deals, bribing people, bringing folk to a meeting and saying, okay, I got this and you give me that and I cut back on this and I do that and forget about the pure poor people that's going to be affected, but that's okay. They used to the externals of worship without going deep inside. That's why I said you know, when that little praise break, just let the music play and let the spirit minister to you deep. Yeah. Oh, I remember I said, yeah. Just offer some calves, works for the crooked prophets, works for the crooked priests we have. If I want to get a nice word from somebody in the church, or if I want to get somebody to support me, just write out a check. And they'll go and risk everything they have worked hard for just because they got one big check from me. Right, right. Just a thousand rivers of oil, no problem here. It works for the more countries and governmental powers. Just give them what they want. Even off of my firstborn. Mm -hmm. yeah. I almost worked for Father Abraham. I mean, what is it? Everybody has his or her price. Come on, prophet, tell me. What do I need to do to make it right with God? What do I need to do to get back in the good graces of God? What do I need to do so God won't be mad at me? No, not. How big the check needs to be? And then when I write it, I want you to go and have a photo op with me and tell the people that God said that I'm going to be all right. That's the problem, right? Problem with their offer is that you can't buy God with any price. And if you broke, you ought to shout. Because... <laughs> If God was all about how much you pay yeah, in, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Amen, lights and walls. Yeah, yeah. We can't manipulate God. We can't give God hush money. We can't buy God's favor. Let me bump. Let me just get blunt. Can I get blunt? Yeah. We can go around calling ourselves pimping God, putting God on the street corner, and having God come in and bring all the blessings of God's hard work. We must respond to grace much better than that. Oh we can't pimp God out. So maybe in this moment of resistance, we need to stop playing around with God. Stop trying to fool God. Stop saying what you do, what you will do, when you know that you're not going to do. Stop trying to fake the funk for just playing flogging on God. We can't manipulate, denigrate, or play a hate on God. Lord does want something. Lord does require something. The best part about this is that we already know what it is. Because God has already shown us. We know because it's been uh, around since the ages of time. We know because it's all around us. We know because it's in the word. What does the Lord require? To act justly, love kindness or mercy, and walk humbly with your God. That's it, act justly. Love mercy and walk humbly with your Lord. And notice that it didn't, uh, it didn't, it's not caught up in the outward appearances. It's not all caught up on what you can do for show. It is not what you can do for the crowds. It's not caught up in what you give and even how much you give. It isn't caught up with what you think you can bargain God with. No, it is what we call the inward journey. And it starts on the inside. Because if the inside is right, the external will be right. Many people tell me, Pastor, when I get it right, I come back to church. When I get it right, I tie. When I get it right, I'll be more committed. When I get it right, I pursue God more thoroughly. When I get it right, when I get it right, when I get it right, then I contribute. When I get it right, then I do what the Lord is calling me to do. When I get it right, when I I'm going to be a new person. Well, I don't mean to bust your bubble, but if you wake on when you can.
can get it right. You have been waiting a long time. The truth is you can't get it right. It's in our very nature to get it wrong. But I dare you to start acting justly, loving some mercy, and begin to walk humbly with your God. You are walking on the right path. And as we continue Black History Month, let us remember our own resistance to, to do love justice, to act merciful, and to walk humbly with our God. Let us focus on what it means to act justly. Love mercy. Walk humbly with our God. I came to remind you, if you would do just that, God would say, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done. When you're out in the street, well done. When you step up and stand up, well done. When you tell somebody what you need to say, well done. When you pray, well done. When you praise, well done. When you preach, well done. When you teach, well done. I just love mercy. Walk yeah. humbly with our God. Oh, can you walk with God today? Can you walk with God today? Can you walk with God today? And as I close this little word, I'm thinking about all of those saints who have gone before us now. The ones I was telling you that was in a great crowd of witnesses. They didn't have a lot of money. They didn't have uh, uh, people that they could rub elbows with of the rich and powerful. They could only get a word in edgewise sometimes. They didn't have the best of educations. They didn't have degrees all on the wall. But they had one thing. They knew how to act justly. They knew some love and mercy. And they knew how to walk humbly with their God. And they just kept on walking. And I came to remind somebody here today that even when you get tired, keep on walking. Even when the town going gets rough, keep on walking. Even when the going gets tough, keep on walking. That's why we got resistance in our blood. That's why we got it in our veins. We can keep on walking. We don't expect anything to change overnight. But God is with us. God is with us. Act through us. Lead us and guide us and keep us. And when we get there, God will be there. When we look back, God is cleaning up messes. And when we walk side by side, we see God all around us. Keep walking. Keep walking. Keep walking. Keep walking. Love, Judge. Is love mercy and walk humbly with your God. And if you do that, you on the right track. Good and faithful service. Well done. Stand to your feet. Somebody here today. may be looking to accept Jesus for the first time, looking to be baptized, looking even to recommit back unto the Christ. But then if you're looking for a church home, you're looking for some place where you can be nurtured in this season in your life. 